Hi there, and welcome to my Sunday show. Wherever you are tuned in in the world, it's 12 noon Pacific where I am um, here in California. And I know that it's evening in Europe in the, and in the UK. It's probably middle of the night in Asia and Australia. And, uh, but wherever in the world you are, thank you for tuning in. And if you're watching live, that's great. If you're watching live, um, please post some questions because I'll get to them in a bit. And my intrepid Danny, my uh, producer, he's going to look for relevant questions. And um, I wanted to just show off my teacup before I get started. So I have, see, because I drink tea, I'm a tea drinker, not a coffee drinker. But I have a little bit of a, shall we say, obsession <laughs> with pretty teacups. I tend to have a little bit of a collection, which... Um, one of the questions that you should not ask Danny is, what is it like to live with me, okay? So, um, and chances are, if you do ask him, that's the one he's gonna pull up. But anyway, I have a little bit of a, a teacup obsession and I like tiny teacups. And I like big teacups too. I like big mugs as well. But the thing is with tea, I like to have my tea hot, warm at least. I don't like, I don't like it when it gets cold. So what I tend to do is, if I'm drinking tea out of a big mug, it gets cold before I get through it. But what I do is I like to put my tea in a flask or thermos or whatever you call it, wherever in the world you are, and that keeps it hot. And then I pour little sips of it into, into my little teacups. So, um, and I know that several of you notice my teacups, hence it's given me more of an incentive to try and use a different teacup each week. So let's get to our topic at hand. I'm going to ask Boo to read out my first question. So he's picked out these questions that are relevant to the subject. Oh, and I see a comment from S.N. Thevirgo. Beautiful teacup. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, you say beautiful Anita, beautiful teacup. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> and uh, Danny, you can go ahead and ask me the first question. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Anita. Question from one of your fans. Anita, what's the difference between healing and curing? I love that question. And, um, um, and this is a question that comes up often. So, so what we do, what we're doing today is that we've actually picked out some of the questions that come up over and over again, which Danny um, then reads out behind the scenes. So what's the difference between healing and curing? In my opinion, in my world, there's a huge difference between healing and curing. So for me, healing starts at the soul level. You have to heal from the soul level. And if you've been following me or watching some of my other videos, and if you haven't, please go back and watch them. There's one that I call the tip of the iceberg. Actually, the whole, the whole title is the tip of the iceberg and the law of attraction. I'd love for you to watch that one because in that one, I speak about how we are more than our physical bodies. So if you imagine that actually who you are, your consciousness, your soul, your spirit, whatever you want to call it, is so much bigger than your physical body. And so if you think in terms of an iceberg, what you can see, which is above the water, is literally just the tip. But actually, there is more iceberg that you cannot see that is below the water. That is actually how we are. There is more of us that you cannot see. So healing starts from healing at the soul level, at the beneath the, the water line or beneath what we can see or beyond what we can see. Because illness starts at the soul level. Um, it starts at, it can be caused by anything like our soul has this intention to come and express in the physical, to express that tip of the iceberg or that tip of who we are as a physical being. And maybe we are not fulfilling that. Or maybe that physical person feels separate from the rest of who we are or feels separate from everyone else and it's suffering and it's lonely. Now, when we heal, we need to heal the whole iceberg or the whole person. But curing only looks at the physical symptoms of what is appearing on the tip of the iceberg. So curing 
only manages the symptoms and that's the way I view it. True healing can only be done at the soul level. And so um, when people ask me questions like, so do you think it has to be done from the mind or the soul? It's not the mind, but the mind is your tool with which to apply the things you learn. But it's healing is done from the soul level, level. But people say, does that mean we don't have to worry about, about medicine or doctors or food and diet? So what I say is that you need to do whatever feels right for you at the time. If you, um, if you need surgery or if you feel and believe that you need surgery, then have the surgery. But my point is that um, we need to heal from the soul level to actually eradicate the root of the problem. And that is the part that I am most interested in doing. And what people do in terms of managing their symptoms, whether it's through, uh, and not just managing their symptoms, but in terms of taking care of their physical bodies, that's entirely up to you. Whether you go for conventional, alternative, combination, energy healing, whatever resonates with you. And I'll talk to you a bit more about that because I know we have a question about that coming up. But, um, but that part of it is only a very small part of it. The bigger part of an illness is healing at the soul level. And I know that the next question that my listeners are going to have is how do you heal at the soul level? And so this is the part that interests me. And it really is about getting down to who am I? What have I come here to express? Um, am I fulfilling my purpose? Um, am I able to receive? Because many of us are, are givers. Many of you who are attuned uh, to, who, who are my fans, my followers, my audience, you're givers. And so many of you are terrible at receiving. And I've already done many videos on this subject. So again, I would like you to go back and, and re-listen to them. There is one about receiving. There is one in particular I, um, I would love for you to watch if you're dealing with an illness is called What I Would Do Differently Knowing What I Know Now. That is about really healing at the soul level. Um, but really to answer that question of what is the difference between healing and curing, curing only manages the physical symptoms and healing heals you right from the soul and it heals the whole you. The, um, it heals the spiritual you, the soul you, and that is what then manifests in the physical. So the point is not about ignoring the physical, but it's a healing from the inside out because that tip of the iceberg is actually a reflection of what's underneath. And if your soul is suffering, if it's dying, if it's crying, if it's um, not feeling fulfilled, that's what will be reflected in your physical body. And that's why you will be, if you don't heal the soul, you will be spending a lifetime just managing your symptoms. But if you heal the soul, that's when you can see the symptoms really dissipate. But what I want to also say here is that sometimes when people heal their soul and they can feel fully healed and they can realize that their work is done here and it's time for them to go. So death is not the end. It's not final. It's a transition. Um, it's a transition into the other realm or into um, another dimension. So let's call it another dimension. It's a transition into another dimension. They haven't lost the battle. And very often um, it is because they've realized that they have been trying to hold on longer and they're doing everything they can to hold on when maybe they have work to do at another level in another dimension. And healing their soul makes them realize this and think, ah, I'm okay with letting go and making the transition into what's awaiting for me next. And so healing can actually lead to that transition to the next level, which we here interpret as death. And then we say they lost the battle. They didn't heal. So I just want to explain that as well. Um, so now I think we're ready to go into the next question. And I'll just, 
I, I also see some great comments on the, on the screen. Um, Gail Greg Jolly, I thought I was enjoying life when I became ill and I was in good health up until the time. So how can I figure out what the soul needs in order to heal? I am mystified. That's a great question. Let me just address that while we're on this subject. So um, even when you are enjoying life, um, sometimes you can be uh, you you can be shocked by getting getting something, an illness or something that hits you unexpectedly. Usually, what to me what that means is I mean there can be several meanings, but here's the one that I. I sense, I don't know why, I sense this is the one that, Gail, you need to hear, is that the, the process of going through this, the healing or dealing with whatever you're dealing with is actually to take you to the next level of what you are doing right now. Now, I don't want to undermine whatever the pain or the, um, or the illness, but what it does is when you when you're already doing things and you're enjoying life and you're doing things that feel right to you but when you are hit by something some kind of a illness or something it forces you to go inward deeper it really does it forces you to go inward and question things deeper and um unfortunately also we live in a culture or a paradigm where the first thing that happens, the first thing the outside world tells you is that, oh, all this, you see, all this stuff doesn't work. All this stuff you've been saying about following your passion, following it, it doesn't work. It's all nonsense. It's all rubbish. That's the first thing you're going to hear or feel. And that's the first thing that's going to actually bring you down. But when you allow yourself, when you get to that place where you're like, no, this can't be all, or I'm at rock bottom. What do I have to lose? When you get to that space when that you can listen again to your inner guidance, your inner voices. And again, please listen to my video called the voices inside my head. And I, um, I actually get those voices all the time. And even when I get hit by something, it's not that my life is hunky dory because of what I do. But every single roadblock, every single hurdle, every single little illness or stumbling block that I come across, actually for me, because my purpose seems to be in teaching others, it seems to be in sharing what I go through. And so I find every little roadblock, every little thing, the minute I start to doubt it and I say, oh my God, it's not working. And then I get still and I get quiet and I can go sit in nature. I can sit quietly. I can go to my favorite spots around me. I can surround myself with my little crystals or I can go um, to the ocean and listen to, to the waves. And that's when I hear this voice saying, this is just part of what you need to learn so you can teach it. That is exactly what my voice tells me when I go through every challenge. It actually says, this is part of what you need to learn so that you can teach it. So that's my message. What I want you to do is look for your message. So there's nothing wrong in what I'm doing. I'm not being punished. I'm not getting a challenge because I got something wrong. I am following my passion. I love my life. I love everything about it. And yet I still get challenges. And that voice comes in and says that you haven't done anything wrong. You need to go through this hurdle so you can teach others. So anyway, I hope that helps you with, um, with your question. So, sorry, I just love drinking tea out of this cup. It's such a cute cup. Um, and what have we got now? We have another question from another viewer. Anita, does food and toxins play a part in our healing and in our illnesses? I love that question too, because again, that's um, a question that comes up um, pretty often. And the answer is going to be yes, but with a, um, with a caveat. 
So it can almost be a yes and a no. Um, the guidance for what food or what toxins are causing your illness comes from inside. So that connection with the soul, with your whole iceberg, that is actually more important. Um, and so again, as a um, culture, we tend to look outside for our answers. And this is our downfall. This is truly our downfall is that, um, is that we tend to look outside. So for example, when I was diagnosed with cancer in, back in 2002, what did I do? I went outside of me for all my answers. And there are so many options available today. Whether you go to the doctor, the first thing. Now for me, going the medical route was really, really scary. That was for me. It may not be scary for, for you. It may be the first thing that you reach for and it may be something that assures you that you can hand it over to a doctor and they can take over your life and, and they can take over your healing process. Maybe that's what you need. Um, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to knock you for that because you need to believe in what, what resonates for you. Um, for me, I was afraid of going the hospital route because I had watched people die. And to me, it appeared as though the, the, um, the conventional therapies that were offered in the hospitals, it appeared as though it made them sicker. I understand now that actually it's because they weren't healing on a soul level all this time that um, that is why they got sicker. But anyway, having said that, I went for natural therapies and they would work for a time. Like I even spoken about the time I went to India and I found myself being healed. But then I went back to my own community in, in Hong Kong and the illness started to come back because I went into fear again. Now, when the illness started to come back and I started to research everything natural, I started to research and, um, and all of these things are fantastic in and of themselves, whether it's Ayurveda, whether it's traditional Chinese medicine, whether you follow Western medicine or the um, Gerson therapy or each of these things, um, you know, German energy medicine, they're brilliant in and of themselves. However, what happened with me, because there's so much content out there, I started to get fearful. I started to dabble in everything. And if I wasn't following all of them, I would get really fearful. So for example, if I was doing Ayurveda, I was supposed to eat dairy um, at that time. It was encouraged that I eat dairy and that I eat hot food. But when I was following another therapy, a Western, um, a, a Western cancer healing therapy, I was supposed to eat as much raw vegan food as possible. And so I would get scared, I would get cravings for hot cooked food. And when I would eat it, I would get scared that I was feeding the cancer and the cancer was growing. And so everything I was doing felt really fearful because I hadn't healed from the soul level. So at what point does the external world and the food and everything become important? It becomes important when you acknowledge that you are a soul first, you are spirit first, you are energy first, you are um, consciousness first, you acknowledge that and you take your guidance from within and then, um, and, and it's okay to do research as long as you realize you are soul first. The research that you do is to give you the options. It's like a palette. Okay. So when I look at the outside world, when I go on the internet, I see, ah, these are all the options available. So research is okay. Knowledge is good. However, which knowledge to apply to you, to your body specifically, that has to come from inside. It's not about somebody saying to you, do this or you will die. And I hate messages like that. And anybody who says to you, you have to do this, I actually run a mile from them. I, I kind of, I recoil. I really do. I think, no, you're not going to tell me what to do. I'm going to my consciousness, my spirit, my soul is going to tell me what to do. So this is what I want to tell you. I want to tell people, I'm not here to tell you, believe in me. I'm here to tell you, believe in yourself, get in touch with that self. The reason why 
you're not able to do that is because most people don't tell you to do that. Most people are saying, I have the answer. I have the answer. I have the answer. When you're faced with 20 people who tell you, you have the, they have the answer. What do you feel? You feel fear. Which one is right? What if I pick the wrong one? And when you're desperate and you're sick, you feel fear and you give your power away to these people. And then if you find one's not working, you're like, oh no, I got to try this one. And then you feel fearful. Maybe I chose the wrong one. Maybe it should be that one. The important thing <clears throat> is to realize that you have to tune in. And then from the inside, you have to then make the choice, not from what they're saying, but, uh, and I hope I'm making this clear. If you think of all of them as a palette telling you what they offer. This is what I offer. This is what I offer. This is what I offer. And, and then you ask yourself, okay, body or okay, soul consciousness. Tell me what does my body need? What feels right for my body? And then you can actually take time for yourself. Nothing is a rush. People will say, you got to do it now. Make the decision now. You don't have much time. That's not true. That illness or whatever you want to call it, dis-ease has actually been in your consciousness level for a long, for a while before it manifests in your body. You're not going to die tomorrow. Take 24 hours, take 48 hours, take whatever time you need, turn inward and actually, um, and actually ask yourself with each one, ask yourself, okay, if I think of going with this person's answer and following this, how does it feel? And you know, you can get in a comfortable position and you ask yourself, how does this feel for me? And then take note of how it feels. You can even scale it from one to 10. Does it feel, what would I score how it feels? Now think of another one and another and another. And if any of them feel fearful, that's not good for you. Don't go for the ones that feel fearful because there will be some that you will feel, oh, I'm scared not to do this. That's actually the very reason not to do it is that you're doing it for the wrong reasons. You're doing it out of fear because here's the thing. You want to do the ones that make you feel good because when you feel good, you're actually enhancing your immune system. Fear actually erodes at your immune system because fear takes you into the fight or flight and you can't avoid fear. We have to embrace fear when it happens, but you don't want to, when you're faced with a palette of 10 or 20 choices, you don't want to choose a long course of treatment that's going to make you feel fearful throughout the whole course of treatment because that is going to erode some of the goodness that it's purportedly doing for you. So um, I love that question. Um, thank you to all the people who've asked it in their different ways over a period of time. So now let's take... A question <laughs> and uh, oh and just a comment from Lillian Wong thank you you say thank you Anita for this amazing video on this beautiful Sunday namaste Lillian thanks Lillian I'm so glad you're enjoying it and I'm gonna go back afterwards and read the comments and again the comments are always very helpful um, in um, in determining what you guys really want to hear more about and please do check out my past videos because I do notice in the comments there are always a lot of questions which I have answered in my past videos and please check out my YouTube channel because they're all organized there properly uh, as a channel so do check it out and please subscribe if you like my content and share it and share this video if you think you know someone who will benefit from what I've said. You know what you forgot to tell people? What did I forget to tell you them? You forgot to tell them that if they actually like the stuff that you talk about, they should come to one of your workshops. <laughs> That's true. So in my workshop, I do actually teach you how to turn inward, how to listen to your body, how to spend time in asking it the questions. Um, we do spend time healing and even visualizing yourselves being healed, seeing yourself healed. Um, and the problem with our medical paradigm is that the focus is on illness 
At my workshops, the focus is on wellness. So you know what to look for so that you can focus on that and make that bigger in your life as opposed to the focus being on illness. I can never understand that. I find our medical paradigm so back to front and upside down. And the biggest focus is always money. <clears throat> the pharma companies rule the roost when it comes to medicine. So um, I'm not a big fan of it. <clears throat> but of course, I do understand that there are people that rely on it. And I'm, and if you do, please don't come off your meds or your treatments or anything. But while you are on it, please also remember to tune in to yourself, your inner self, um, and, and tune in and realize that you are so much more than a physical body. Um, and, uh, yeah, and yeah, that's kind of what we do in my retreats and workshops and we're starting to do a lot more like group healings and I will be taking people on their own simulated near-death experience. So thanks for that reminder. I keep forgetting to talk about my workshops and things. Speaking of a simulated near-death experience, do you want to tell them who your surprise secret guest is going to be on a surprise secret Thursday <laughs> Facebook Live coming up in four days or do you want to keep it a secret <laughs> no we can tell them and 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 give them the spoiler so spoiler alert um, on probably on thursday we're going to do a just a pop-up either wednesday or thursday we're just going to pop up and do a facebook live i have a guest coming over it's barry goldstein and we Yay, are going barry. to give you a taste Yay, of barry. my i know barry is like danny's brother from another mother <laughs> they almost look alike as well um so barry and i are going to give you a taste of my new meditation cd which is going to be launched on february the second is it actually it's uh, going to make it's it on actually going to be launched on it's actually going to be available february the first but i think if everybody waits until February the 2nd to buy it, Yes. then you can probably get, with all the people that are going to buy it, you can probably then chart on the billboard charts again. Oh, wow. But if everybody waits until the 2nd to buy it, otherwise the numbers get skewed, and then maybe you don't make it on the billboard. Oh, well, you know, as long as it goes into the right hands, that's always good. But um, Yeah, but it's so cool. I mean, you get onto <laughs> Billboard, you know. I know. Our last CD, uh, the last CD I did with Barry two years ago got onto the Billboard charts thanks to all of you. So really, thank you for your support. More than anything, I feel so much gratitude for all of you. And I, and I love, love, love doing what I do. And this CD takes you on your own simulated near-death experience. I think it's almost one hour long. It's one long meditation of almost one hour and it takes you on a journey of your own near-death experience so that you can get your own insights. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And uh, someone by the name of Sylvia Lackey says, I love Danny's voice too. Aw, oh, thank you, Sylvia. And has anyone asked what it's really like to live with me? Uh, yes, a lot of people have actually asked that, and I've been secretly typing away over here. And telling them what it's really like, right? Absolutely, exactly. <laughs> and and oh, so <laughs> don't tell them about my shoe and handbag fetish I'll, I'd never say anything like that, no, absolutely not. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to tell them about my collection of XLR to XLR cable. My and your hangers my hangers and my collection of uh, TRSS And the thing cables. about Danny, and I love him so dearly, but he needs all the hangers in his closet to be identical. It has to all be the same, the same shape, the same brand, the same. So every time he buys new hangers, it has to be the, the same hangers. So um, yes, he's very orderly. <laughs> and I love that because, because now, because my house is so orderly and clean because he 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 just he's like that i love him for it <laughs> and and look and he's looking at me saying next question <laughs> over to you darling all right <laughs> a listener or a viewer rather has written and i don't think they're talking about the wall behind you but they say anita if you could paint a picture of the other side what would it look like See, that's a question that's come up quite a few times. And um, the other side is almost, it's indescribable. And it is more real than, it feels like everything is more real than this side. 
and um, and I and I once actually said it it's realer than this side, and somebody actually corrected me and said there's no such word as realer, and that's true. There isn't, and it's so it's more real than the side. However, I do tend to make up words to describe the other side, simply because words don't exist in the English language to describe it. So the colors are sharper, much sharper, but um, the thing is you appear wherever you want to be. This is the hard part to explain. So if you want to journey into the universe, into the stars, into other planets, that's what you will do. If you want to journey into the future, that's what you will do and that's what you'll see. If you want to journey into the past, that's what you'll see. And this is often why I say time is not the same on the other side. It's not linear, it's non-existent because um, you can go into the future and into the past as though you're going to a destination that already exists right here and right now. So how do you explain that? Even I don't know how to explain that. I don't know. And, and, and this is the other interesting thing is when I'm without my physical body, it all makes sense. It made a lot of sense. But when I'm back in my physical body, it's like, okay, I don't know how to explain it. I don't understand it myself, how that happened. And so with me, I saw my future. I saw my past. And the future was like, this is your potential future. If you are authentic and you love yourself and you live your life fearlessly, this is how it could unfold. Um, and so I feel that that is my... Um, in a sense, you can call it your destiny. My destiny was to do that. But the difference between destiny and free will is that you have the free will as to whether to follow your destiny or not. And when we, when we follow our destiny, we're following our calling. We're following our passion. We're following what we came here with the intention of doing and being. But when we stop following our destiny, it's because of things like fear. We get led astray. We stop believing in ourselves. Um, we, we undermine ourselves. We stop loving ourselves. This is why I tell people, love yourself like your lives depend on it, because it does. Um, I, would, um, I would like to uh, develop new words because words don't exist. It's very, very limited. Like for example, in other languages, the term for life force energy is a single word. Like in, um, in Sanskrit or in any Indian language, it's prana. Prana means life force energy. In Japanese, it's ki. In Chinese, it's chi. Um, that's in Mandarin, it's chi. In Cantonese, it's hei. And so there is a single word that means life force energy. And it's part, that word is part of your vocabulary. It's your everyday vocabulary. But in English, there is no such word. And so we describe it by calling it life force energy. Life force energy is a description. And the fact that there's no such word means that in the English language, and for people who English is their first language, life force energy is not a thing. It's not something you consider. And this is the problem with language. When no language exists for something, it means it's not something you think about or consider or factor as being real. And so I notice this because I speak three or four languages. And so I know the importance of words existing in a language because only when the words exist or the reason why the words exist it's be is because it's a thing in that culture. The words don't exist because it's not a thing in that culture. So in our paradigm, that in the dominant thinking, life force energy, that iceberg that I speak of, that consciousness, all that that I speak of, it's not a thing that people consider or believe in. But anyway, back to the topic of if I could paint a picture of what the other side looks like, I would use colors that don't exist. Um, and it would be changing. It would be not just three-dimensional. If it was a painting, it would be more than holographic. It would be four-dimensional if that is possible. And to me, four-dimensional or five-dimensional means that it changes as you look at it to reflect what you're thinking. 
that's what the picture would look like. So that if there was like a canvas, it would be holographic. But as you look at it, as your mind, it would be an immediate reflection of your mind. So if your mind is thinking things that are dark and fearful, you would kind of see that appearing. But the minute you think wonderful, beautiful thoughts, you would see beautiful colors that you never even knew exist. And there would be beauty and sky and sun and butterflies and meadow. So it would be like an alive and vibrant picture. That's what it would be. And that's really what it felt like on the other side. It felt like life is a reflection of who I am. And that's why it's so important to love yourself and to bring love into your life and to bring joy because that's what your life is a reflection of. You are creating this three-dimensional picture all the time. In the fourth dimension, you see yourself creating it. Um, in the third dimension, you are being yourself creating it, but not realizing that you are creating it. You think you are reacting to the outside world, but in actuality, you are creating your own outside world. So thank you for that great question. And um, I also want to go into, uh, there was a beautiful lady by the name of Valerie Wild Owl who posts, I see her posts regularly. And I know she asked me the same question for a, for a few weeks. And I responded to her and said, I'll, I'll answer it next week. And then that was for last week. And I forgot to respond to her question. So I would like to respond to it today. And uh, we're going to pull her question up onto the screen. So Valerie Wildal asks, um, she says that it's about finding a way to have the equivalent experience to your experience, like through ayahuasca. And there's a second part to the question is why do some of us get to have it and others uh, and the rest of us have to be blind about how and where to follow our path? Okay, so I'm going to answer both questions. So number one, with ayahuasca or other types of plant medicines that allow you to recreate your experience. So I actually tried it once. I was invited to come to a plant ceremony in Costa Rica. And, um, and, it, and so I accepted the invitation and I went and I tried it because people were curious as to what I would feel about it. How would I compare it to my near death experience? So, um, on the one hand, I think that people who do it, that's great. They get a lot out of it and it's fabulous. And I like the fact that it's done in a controlled environment. It's done by shamans. So if you do choose to do it, I want you to know that you need to do it somewhere where it's very safe. The environment where I did it, um, they, had, um, they had medical paramedics there who lived there on site on the property because they were very, very responsible, very careful. So I want to say that. But, um, and so, but I want to give you my experience and my opinion on that is that when I had the experience, um, it was a wonderful experience, but I didn't feel I needed it. So let me explain that. Um, so if you do feel you need it, I have no um, judgment, like go for it if you need it. However, ask yourself that once you've had such an experience, are you then going to become addicted to the experience to escape from life? Or are you going to use that experience to take you on your life's purpose? So this is, this is the part I want to get to about these experiences. There are two ways that people handle it. One is, they use the insights from that experience to take them on their life course. If that's what they do, fantastic. I would say, please go and have that experience and use those insights to take you on that life course. And if you go with a responsible group of people, uh, teachers, they will teach you how to integrate it into your life and to use it. However, there is a secondary response that people have is that, oh my God, this experience is so beautiful. It is so far removed from the life that I am living. Um, I need to keep having these experiences to escape from my life. So that is the less favored response. And if that is the response, if that is what you're feeling, 
What you really need to do is to ask yourself, why am I living a life that I need to escape from? So that's what I want to say about these experiences. Yes, I have experienced it, but I, it also made me realize that the insights I got were exactly what I was already doing. I did receive a few good new ones. It was a good confirmation. It was a great confirmation for me for the life I'm already living. Um, but I don't need to escape my life for anything. So that's my way of saying to you that everything you do, whether it's a, um, it's a simulated near death experience, whether it's an ayahuasca experience, remember these are just tools. These are tools. And if so, ask yourself, am I using these to escape my life or am I using these to make my life more like what I experienced in that experience. It's got to be a match. I don't feel I need those experiences because I actually feel that I can, that I'm living the life of my desire of my, and I feel guided all the time. And that is the space that where I would like you to see yourself. I would like you to see yourself being guided, being connected all the time where you don't need to escape your life. That is why I tell people, don't take jobs that you hate, that, you know, you hate your Mondays to Fridays. And then on Fridays you go get drunk just to escape everything. And then on Sunday night and Monday morning, you're dreading going back to work again. You've got, thank God it's Friday. And then you've got Monday morning blues. What kind of a life is that? So, um, create the life that you love. And that is so important. Um, the second part of Valerie's question was about um, near-death experiences. Does everybody get to experience them and why do only a few people experience them? Um, so I want to say that actually everybody has access to it. A near-death experience is um, almost like opens your eyes to something that is already there. It is always there and we all have access to those voices and even if it is an ayahuasca experience that leads you to realize or understand what it is, or even if it is an actual NDE, a near death, what it does is that it makes you realize that you've been living life all wrong up to now. And an NDE can be a gift or a curse. For many people, it's a curse because when they realize that they've been living their life a certain way, that's not what they intended it to be they realize also that they can't, um, they, they also realize that, but I can't change it. I'm so intricately um, woven into this life that there's no way I can change it. So learning that my life is all wrong is actually really painful. And so not everybody is ready to realize that in boom as an NDE. But whereas to realize it slowly by tuning in and realizing I am guided, I need to listen to the messages and those messages will help you unravel in a slower way. And for many people, that is the bigger gift, unraveling your life step by step by step by step as opposed to getting that boom, that NDE, because that could be a curse because you could find that you are so intricately woven into your life that you, you can't unwind yourself, that there's so many, that you really need to have something more gentle. And this is what I speak about in my, um, about my healing sanctuaries, what I want to one day develop. And I want it to be something that anybody who is dealing with chronic illnesses can come to. You know, I hate it that insurance only covers conventional medical hospitals, which are all funded by the big pharma companies. I, that is something I do have a gripe about. If anything makes me angry, it's that because that is not the way to true healing. And this is not, um, an attack on doctors. Many doctors are wonderful people. Many doctors I know are recommending people to read my book. Many doctors want it to be different. Nurses are angels. I love angels. They are angels on earth, but I'm talking about our medical paradigm and our beliefs in the medical paradigm and the power that we have given them, the power we've given the big pharma. Anyway, the healing sanctuaries that I talk about would help you unravel your life 
at a pace that you can handle it. There would be people, there would be uh, healers, there would be coaches, there would be doctors, there would be people there to help you unravel it. Um, and that is the way forward. That is truly the way forward. A question that somebody sent me during the week that I just want to recall. Someone said that when I spoke about healing sanctuaries, I spoke about diagnostic tools and they want to know, like they wanted me to say, where have I heard of such diagnostic tools and uh, where do they exist? My point is, I haven't heard of them existing. My point is, if we can imagine it, we can create it. My idea for diagnostic tools is tools that can measure our life force energy and where we are losing energy and what activities are making us feel more energized. And the more we are um, energized or the more we can stay in high life force energy, the more likely we are to heal as opposed to using drugs or diagnostic uh, tools that squish our boobs as flat as a pancake, as opposed to those which are archaic, we need to develop new diagnostic tools that are more energy-based. Um, that is the way forward. So my point was we need to actually do research and development in that direction as opposed to the old physical way of purely being focused on the physical. So anyway, um, that's my little standing on the soapbox. Every time we talk about the medical paradigm, this is kind of what, what happens. Um, so let me actually see if we have any more questions or is it time? Um, I think my producer is beckoning to me that it's time to wind down. So please, um, uh, Please share this video if you feel it helps anyone. Please do come to my retreats if you feel it'll benefit you and if you can. And I do want to have a shout out here. If there's anybody out there that uh, is or who follows my work, who is a video editor, I would love to hear from you. I am looking for somebody who understands my work. And this is very important to me because I have all these long videos, probably 60, 70, 80 now that are close to, uh, that are uh, 50 minutes to an hour long. I actually want to have somebody who understands my work, who can go through those videos and cut out clips that are um, clips of maybe eight minute, 10 minute, 12 minute, that are easily shareable, that, you, that they think are important for people to hear in a soundbite, in a short soundbite. Because there's so many things I've said that I really, really want people to get this. I want them to understand it. I want them to know this. But not everyone has time to sit through a 50 minute video to siphon through everything else I say or to sift it. I need help there. So what I would love is somebody who could independently go through my videos uh, who knows my work and who knows what are the points that are really important that they can cut and then who can edit it and maybe make it pretty and put cuts in edits, pretty edits and top and tail it, whatever, you know, the magic that video editors do. Um, so yeah, we would like some help in that department and that person would work with Danny on this. So if you know of anyone or if you are someone, this is my shout out to you. Um, and um, let's see, respond, where should I tell them to respond? I'm turning to my uh, intrepid boo at the moment. So should they write an email? Should they write a comment down here in the comments? Either they can put a comment down here at the uh, bottom of this uh, video or ideally they can go up to your website, anitamorjani.com and click on the contact us and send us a little note through the uh, through the email there. Great. So send us a note. It's contact, C-O-N-T-A-C-T, -T, hyphen us, U-S, at anitamorjani.com. And if we end up getting a flood of responses, uh, we'll probably will be kind of asking you guys to show a sample of your work or whatever, but I'm going to leave that to Danny. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you for tuning in. And uh, I will look forward to seeing you all next week. But I, if not before, I'm going to see you sometime during the week as well with Barry Goldstein. Thank you very much. Take care and bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to my video. And if you really enjoyed it, I would love for you to subscribe. And the subscribe button is here. And also I would love for you to watch my suggested video, which is over here. And if you love my content, please feel free to share it to people who you think that would benefit from it. Thank you.